Uh, good morning, and um, welcome to the GCIC cohort five graduation. It's actually interesting. We we never thought we'd be having a graduation in this kind of environment, but we're all adapting and all becoming uh, digital in the way we do things. So when we first inducted cohort five, I I. I I doubt if anyone said we'll be graduating and everybody would be in their own homes and tuning in through digital platforms. It would have been like, which world do you think we're in? <laughs> Unfortunately, COVID has ensured that we are in that world today and that's exactly what we are doing. So um, I'm going to start off by calling on Ruka, who is going to give us the welcome address. Um, for welcome address for this, um, the, the, this graduation. After which we have Bright Simmons um, going to give us um, a keynote address. Bright Simmons is going to, um, he's a founder of MP Degree and he's going to um, tell us a bit about how to survive this pandemic and um, ensure that our businesses are continuing to, um, to grow. And of course then we're going to have the certificates given out to um, the um, gra graduates. Unfortunately, in place, so we cannot give the certificate out to people. But you know, we will congratulate um, graduates. You've done a great job. You've gone through one year of incubation at the GCIC, learned a whole lot. Hopefully, like we say in the GCIC, we've managed to help you grow in terms of your skills, in terms of the kind of mindset you need to survive as an entrepreneur and hopefully provide that you with all that you need to um, take your businesses to the next level. And of course, we will also want to hear from the graduates. So um, Papayao from Green Campus will then give us a speech before we close it all. So to start off with, please welcome um, Madam Ruka Sanusi, uh, is that to give us the welcome address. Thank you very much, Naz. So let me start by extending a very warm welcome to you all this morning and to extend my personal congratulations to you for completing your business incubation program at the Ghana Climate Innovation Center. It is my personal and sincere hope that this particular business incubation program has been of high value to you as founders and CEOs to your team members, as well as to your business. For myself and my colleagues, it's been a huge privilege as well as a responsibility to design and deliver our current business incubation program. And we could not have done this without the financial support of the Dutch and Danish governments, as well as the World Bank, who have funded CIS's work since inception. And for this, we remain very grateful being stewards of any fund, uh, not least international donor funds, comes with a huge responsibility. And this responsibility is one that we, as well as yourselves as beneficiaries, have embraced with determination. And it is this determination that I've chosen to speak on today as you graduate from the Ghana Climate Innovation Center. And in speaking about determination, I've chosen to focus on values and virtues as propellers of long-term success and business sustainability. For I remain acutely aware that you have over the past 12 months deepened your insight and enhanced your knowledge on the practicalities and realities of what it takes to successfully run a business. I know that you continue to appreciate that entrepreneurship is not for the faint-hearted. And I therefore want to put it to you that armed as you are with this understanding, it is indeed now your values and your virtues that will serve as additional propellers of the business nirvana that you aspire to attain. For our values define us in every walk of life. The virtues that we hold dear will also bolster us. In a world presently defined by a global pandemic that has spurred unprecedented uncertainty, 
the question that many are asking is, how can I make it through another day? Yet still others are asking, when will this be over? And when this is over, what will our world look like? When tomorrow comes, will I, can I, still be relevant? In the midst of such uncertainty, it is your values and your virtues that will sustain you. It was Maya Angelou that said that courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. And whilst one isn't necessarily born with courage, everyone is born with potential. It is that potential that we should all unleash. I want to believe that you are not where you are today through a gamble. I believe you took a calculated risk to start and to grow your business. As such, I believe you gathered courage to unleash potential. I also believe that the cohorts we've incubated at the Ghana Climate Innovation Center are pioneers of the transition to a low carbon green economy in Ghana. And whilst today with the global pandemic, you may find yourself doubting the convictions that propelled you to start your business, I dare you to hold on to the virtue of courage and to know that your best is yet to come. The green economy is the next frontier. Sustainability is on every CEO's agenda. And once it is on every CEO's agenda, it will soon become something that is on every consumer's agenda. The green economy is driving global innovation and offering new competitive opportunities that is leading to profitable business growth for small businesses as well as large corporations. It is the economy that will fuel our tomorrow. It is the economy that will fuel the global recovery from this pandemic. And it is nimble, visionary firms like yourselves who are adjusting to new environmental realities whilst others are being left behind. But being a pioneer is something that comes with tremendous trials and challenges. And it is now that you are exiting from an incubator, when you are exiting from the comfort zone of no cost financial grounds, no cost business advisors, low cost international peer exchange program, and technological support programs that you will have to exercise and strengthen your business lungs and business muscles. It is when you will begin to understand the notion of no pain, no gain, but I urge you, even in the midst of all of this, to hold on to courage in the process. This morning, you will hear from one of Ghana's renowned innovators of contemporary times, Bright Simmons. I've had few occasions to meet with Bright, but as few as they have been, I've always found and left a meeting with Bright, understanding better the notion of values, the notion of virtues, and, and the notion of courage. Staying the course and being determined to go the long haul with your business and innovation, despite monstrous challenges. Bright is a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the African Innovation Foundation. He was on the list of the 35 most impressive global technology visionaries under the age of 35 by the MIT's Tech Review in 2013. He was ranked amongst Quartz's top 30 innovators in 2015 and listed by both the Africa Report and New Africa magazines on their most influential persons list in recent years. In 2016, Bright was announced as the CMBC All Africa Business Leader of the Year in the innovation category. The same year, Fortune magazine named him on their 50 World Greatest Leaders list. Last year, he won the 2019 Scholar Award for Social Entrepreneurship, where his company was awarded a grant of 1.5 million US dollars for being selected. I know that the journey that led to all of those accolades and awards that I have just read wasn't easy. They were founded on extraordinary courage and personal values. And as you graduate from the GCIC today, I extend my very best wishes to you for the future and implore you to stay the course, just like Bright did. 
and offer the very best of your values, the very best of virtues, and bolster, the, bolster courage to the world at large through your innovation and your enterprise. Thank you for your attention. All right, I'm sure if this was, uh, we're all like, we'll, we'll be clapping for Ruka. So let's, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and hopefully you're also clapping in your homes for Ruka. Uh, I'm not sure if Bright Simmons has joined. Um, Bright, if you are on, please let us know so that you can, we can hand over to you. If, Bright, Bright Simmons, are you on? Okay, I think what we need to do is let's watch the GCIC video, um, a video that introduces the GCIC, and then we can do the roll call and come back to it. All right, so uh, can you cue the video Hi. and let's get going. My name going. is Christine Intafashi, a co founder of Tech Shelter mm -hmm. Company Limited, an agribusiness company that leverages on climate smart technologies to help greenhouse farmers with more efficient heat and cook food all year round to feed the growing population. So as a business, joining GCIC, we have the ambition, the goal, and the passion to be successful. But one thing we lacked, one major thing we lacked was structure. Joining the GCIC program was the turning point in our life as entrepreneurs and as a business as a whole. Today, as we speak, We've been ready or made prepared to attract an investment because GCIC made it possible by helping us um, through consultants who shaped us, who helped us put all those structures in place. I can't say more. GCIC has been very transformational or it's been a very transformational program we joined and we are proud to say or we are proud to be part of the cohort five of the GCIC program. On behalf of Tech Shelter, we are grateful to the Gamma Climate Innovation Center for showing faith in us and giving us all the massive support um, they've shown us. We are so grateful and we'll continue to make you proud. Thank you. My name is Cynthia from BioCUS. At BioCUS, we build biodigester systems to treat fecal waste for individuals and organizations. Before we join the GCIC program, we're thinking very transactional in the sense that we're looking at completing a job and getting instant gratification, which was cash. Again, we also lack the technical knowledge in understanding the science behind our systems. And after joining the GCIC program, we had a lot of training and exposure to new ways of doing business through training, mentorship, and the peer exchange. We are also trained by research institutes on the science behind our systems. We also got money to buy a mini extruder machine to help in simplifying our production process. Now we can only dream and hope to build a sustainable and a transformational company. Hey, my name is Kurt Vistara, founder and CEO of Lakeside Farms. Trying to solve agricultural technology and general agricultural services. Before joining GCIC, we had innovated a solid substrate, which we used to produce fresh vegetables for our clients. After joining GCIC's incubation program, we have been able to transform from a sold enterprise to a limited liability company with expert advisory board members who are helping to propel our growth and vision. GCIC has also supported us in acquiring three machines which we are going to use to produce and commercialize our substrates for the agricultural market. Again, GCIC has helped build my capacity to be able to develop and build a world-class business that is contributing to a green planet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Professor Kolipa Duman and I'm the creative lead for Kolipa Assessment. Um, before joining GCIC, it was difficult for me to articulate what my brand stood for and how my brand was positively impacting the environment. It was difficult for me to 
put these informations together and you know communicate it to my customers and to my audience after joining gcic it's been fantastic i had the opportunity to be featured in a newspaper article also i had one of my biggest contracts for last year coming from one of the um, team members in in gcic so i now have a very enriched network of um, of people who are all in the same um, sustainable industry as I am and also I what I personally call I have my FDA approval which is being part of um, GCIC authenticates my my brand and gives it more leverage over other brands who claim to be sustainable because I've actually been in the program and I've actually learned from the process so thank you very much GCIC is it's sad that the journey has ended here, but I'd like to say a very big thank you to everybody on the team. You've been fantastic. And thank you very, very, very much. You really, really, really impacted my business positively. Thank you. My name is Frank Adabre, the CEO of Northlight Solar Limited. Northlight is an indigenous Ghanaian solar company with operations across Ghana. We are into the off-grid market providing direct services and products across the northern regions of Ghana, Savannah Belt, and more recently in the urban areas where we target customers who are under high billing situations who seek alternative energy solutions from our company. My discussion today centers more on our upbeat solutions and the innovation that comes along, which was sponsored by GCIC, which has given us the potential to scale and to have exponential growth in our business and approach to the market. In 2009, when we started Northlight, we served over 15,000 households, reaching across 25 communities in off-grid areas across Ghana. By 2019-2020, we developed one of the smartest innovations called the Solar Hub. The Solar Hub is a solution where we pro provide direct services in communities using a one-stop shop where we do sales, distribution, after sales support, and supporting last mile services, engaging the vibrant youth in employment, creating access and enabling affordable access to our products and services. This would not have been possible without the support of GCIC. The GCIC POC grant, the proof of concept, has allowed us to develop the concept into the first prototype, which gives us confidence that we can increase in our sales and distribution. On behalf of Northlight and the team, behalf of the support team from GCIC, SNB, the TPT grant, I want to say thank you for the support. And we're most grateful that you hear back from us because our aim is to reach a global appeal. Thank you so very much. We have FarmCure Ghana Limited, led by Naila Ufuriwa and Pabing. SysFarm Limited, led by Padiki Ologo. 
AgroSourcing Limited, Richard Zisu Nuchuglo. Green Campus Ghana, Papayao Ejukum Ado. Ray Solar Power, Aurora Chisti. Miji Enterprise, Mohammed Abdo Ganinu. AY Farms, Yaya Abdullahi. Pure and Just Company Limited, Yvette Tete. Pure Organic Tea Maker, Majori Na Ode Kwaku. West Africa Feeds Limited, Rose Sewa Odro. Lakeside Farms, Cletus Dara. Bios US Limited, Cynthia Ave. Nasaglak Company Limited, Elizabeth Bayo. Prime Minister Africa Limited, Debbie Jean Equia E.J. Godson. Sesi Technologies Limited, Isaac Senu Sesi. Green Gold Social Enterprise Limited, Clement Matomasen. Jumeni Technologies Limited, Ejiram Amejo. Gaia Greenfield, Abdallah Eko Manua Smith. Ketikrachi Farms Limited, Theodore Kweku Okanse. Tech Shelter Ghana Limited, Gifty Minta Kwashi. Aqua Green Initiative, Benis Wilmont Opong. Hami Comfort. Amida Idrisu, North Light Solar Limited, Frank Adabri, Sugarland Limited, Judith Essenam Agbenega, Nassam Brand Enterprise, Bismarck Asamoa Asante, Nsroma Farms Limited, Lawrence Kwabinabampo. Green Heat Technologies Limited, Richard Fosu, and Koliko Accessories, Priscilla Koliko Ajeman. So once again, congratulations for your graduation, and I hope this will not be the last time we, we, we stay in touch. Always feel free to, to reach out to us anytime. And like Nas said earlier, the hard copies will be available. So please make the arrangement to come by the office anytime that you, you, you're available. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dominic. And I'm sure all the entrepreneurs are really happy and brimming. Uh, the, the key though is the graduation is just, um, marking your successful completion of the GCSE program. There's a lot more ahead of you. The true test of what you've learned here would be how successful your businesses are. So we're all praying that you have successful businesses and in a few years, we can look up to these businesses and say um, GCIC was a part of the story. Now, the, the next stage we are going to hear from I also went. Um, and I think that's the most important thing to know about Bright Simons as a result of having been to the Presbyterian Boys Secondary School. Um, it was there that he had the idea.
Uh, easiest way I can describe Bright is he's a jack of all trades and master of all. Most of us are jack of all trades and master of none. He's a jack of all trades and master of all. So let's listen to him. Um, the, the one thing I found significant the first time I was, speaking, I was talking to him about entrepreneurship was the fact that he stopped raising funds. He never raised funds, but managed to grow his business significantly. And I think that's something that um, a lot of us need to learn because most of us think we need to raise money. If you're ready, you can share your screen and then take over from me. Thank you very much. Hello, um, Nas. Thanks so much. I'm waiting for my screen to be enabled, my screen sharing to be enabled. Um, Right, are you able to share? No, it's uh, disabled, unfortunately. It's Apologies, disabled. but the host has to um, uh, disable, so um, uh, uh, re-enable the screen sharing. No. Have you enabled it? Please try again. Okay. All right, perfect. Are you good? Yes, thank you so very much. Nas, good. always good. gracious as usual. Um, in a minute, I will commence. So first of all, I want to express how privileged I am, how very much um, appreciative I am of this opportunity to address fellow entrepreneurs um, who have either been through the same journey that I've been and are now um, beginning to consider another path um, or those that perhaps um, have not actually been through the, the, the kind of journeys that I have been in as an entrepreneur, both in Ghana and also in various other African countries. When I received this invitation to serve as the keynote, I was very sure what um, Dominic Nas and the other amazing people that ran this center wanted to achieve was not to bring in someone that could be said to have already been extremely successful in business um, or in their career or professional life in general, but someone that very much appreciates the struggles that uh, entrepreneurs that are just starting off or entrepreneurs that are uh, beginning to take a new journey um, can empathize with those types of people. And that is why I thought it was really uh, inspirational to be here with you at this time and to address the fifth cohort of graduating uh, participants of this really amazing program. So what is interesting is that not too long ago, but in some ways also very long ago, more than 15 years ago, in fact, when I started my entrepreneurial story, I wanted, like you, to be a green entrepreneur. And the very, very first business that I set up with uh, partners, who, you know, some of whom were in the US and some of whom were in Ghana, was actually to try and build a new business model around organic agriculture with some elements of fair trade you know, also in there somehow. And I, I was just looking at the business plan that we built then and the presentations that we did as we went around trying to raise funds. And it was just fascinating then comparing it to the business ideas that were in the brochure that was shared with me, um, that participants of this program have prepared and which is guiding the journey that you're about to embark upon. It was extremely, almost spiritual, um, and, you know, the nostalgia as I realized how close in sentiment 
we are, even though time and space separates us significantly. When I set out to build a company called Waspro, I had been convinced then that organic agriculture was a no-brainer. We have a country where the vast majority of farmers, at least at that time, could not afford a lot of the chemicals that conventional agriculture requires to be successful. Um, and yet, in Europe and in America, people were willing to buy produce that were grown without chemicals and to pay twice or sometimes three times more just to be assured that they were getting something that um, had no chemicals. And I thought this was brilliant. It was the traditional arbitrage opportunity that as entrepreneurs we always look for. So you come to Africa and the farmers can't afford chemicals and for that reason, they can't grow enough. And yet still, elsewhere, if you don't use chemicals, somebody will pay you extra. So why don't you just bridge these two realities? Um, and I set out trying to learn a lot about organic agriculture to build a business around organic agriculture called Rospro in, you know, in partnership obviously with my co-founders. And the, what we're trying to solve was fairly straightforward. The existing organic certification model. So you could go around and say what I'm producing is organic, but unless there was some endorsement, something from someone else that confirmed it, nobody will accept that it's organic. If the supermarkets wouldn't accept it's organic, and if the consumers don't accept it's organic, it will not be marketed as organic to customers. And if we wanted the traditional organic certification, we will have to get consultants from Germany and elsewhere into places like Ghana and Nigeria and spend $1,200 a day doing inspection of farms, doing soil testing, etc. It just wasn't viable, you know. And we thought we could somehow crack this problem by introducing a certification scheme reliant on technology, um, and through this certification scheme, make it possible for poor farmers to get organic certification, to get these tax on their product. This was 15 years ago. A lot has changed since then. Uh, and by so doing, we'll be able to get um, some degree of aggregation of these products, have the organic tax on them, sell them to supermarkets in Europe, starting with the UK, um, and dramatically increase the income of the farmers. Obviously, the... Um, you know, the fact that you have to take into account the, orga um, the organic movement that had already then built up. And those, those practices that were already entrenched was itself the challenge. How were we going to use technology to circumvent this? We were convinced that our model will be integrated and embedded in communities. And by doing so, we will be able to dramatically change the fortunes of Ghanaian farmers. We're going to enter into agreement with microfinance banks that will enable them to support this organic certification process. And by so doing, we're going to be able to create a situation where farmers who are undergoing this transition will see limited um, um, costs. We successfully built a, a pilot model. We went around the world at that time trying to win money. And we're going to um, Seattle, to the University of Washington, to do a showcase um, and investors were crewing all over us. It was an amazing period of my time. I was much obviously younger than I was today. And eventually we failed. We failed for all the usual reasons that most uh, research into business failure have established. The market needs may be there, but, and I'll discuss this in some detail as I progress in my discussion, but you need to establish it in a way that sometimes not always accurate. Typically, you run out of cash, you use some friendly products, a whole range of these types of situations will lead to business failure. The point though, and I'm sure you've heard this many times over, is that success is really not the grand structure within which you operate. It's not as if your overall you know, expectation should be a series of success after success. What I have discovered is that success is a payoff, is the unexpected delightful outcome. But as entrepreneurs, at least from my experience, it looks like failure is really the career. We are experts in failure. We specialize in failure. And by becoming so effective at understanding failure, we build these repertoire of skills. We build these internal capacities. That makes it very likely that unlike other people who also fail, we will see the payoff. But a lot of people tend to think of business um, as or rather as successful um, entrepreneurship as really something that builds up into understanding a formula. And then once you have this formula, it's a formula of success. I don't think that is the case. At least in my experience running WASPRO, what I learned, you know, how it eventually impacted me as I 
I transition away from organic agriculture into ICT, but also still in the social justice domain, I kind of came to the conclusion that the only thing that distinguishes us as entrepreneurs from other, other people and other people that are involved in different types of activities is that we are so good at understanding failure, the experts of failure, we are specialists in failure, and because of that, we have the potential, unlike most other people, to transcend failure. I think that really has become the way that I see the opportunities that are available to those of us that want to take this particular journey to be transformative, to do something dramatically different. We, we should understand failure than the average citizen or the average Joe, and through that effort, how our likelihood of success rate increases correspondingly. I mean, there's a whole science to it, and this is not an academic lecture, I'm not going to go into it. Um, but quite clearly, business failure is often you know, discussed, particularly in our culture, as somewhat linked to your identity as a person. So if you are diligent, and when we're growing up as Ghanaians, I think it is somewhat drummed into us that our personal characteristics are somewhat determinative of success and failure. That, you know, it's a matter of personal characteristics, almost a value set, your morals, things like that. And if you've done business, it's quite, it doesn't take too long to realize that that's actually not very true. A lot of the determinants of success are really environmental. And it's a, so it's a skill set more than something it leads in us. Uh, and in that regard, it's really about how you are changed through failure, how each specific failure incident molds you as opposed to, as opposed to what dynamic, uh, sorry, innately is within you that then enables you to spot opportunity or to be able to respond to adversity. I don't think that is it at all. It's quite evident that it's a skill set. It's something that you need to spend your time working on and polishing. And when I tell you a lot more about why we feel that's was pro and that I meld it into this discussion that I'm having with you about your own journey as green entrepreneurs, I will mention that one of the first things that we discovered was how much more external the process is, the process of failure and success. And every little success we chalk, though of course we have to have some traits like perseverance and the rest, a lot of it were skills that we were acquiring as we're paying a lot more attention to the learning outcomes of the process. Now, what did I learn? Because most people will agree that when it comes to these types of journeys, it's very much how you are able to transform as an entrepreneur, how you are able to rebuild your compass of how you navigate success and failure. And one of the th key things that I recognized was that we tend to have in this space that we are in, this social entrepreneurship, social, entrepreneurship, social innovation, do good that space that we're in. We tend to have this problem of often perceiving this matter as if we are we on a certain moral high ground. And on being on that moral high ground, we are disappointed if others don't share our enthusiasm for doing good. We tend to think of ourselves as some kind of missionaries out to do good, and the rest of the world as waiting to be converted to this perspective. I realized quickly when I first, you know, you know, it's, I spent about seven months building a business model, running around the world, trying to raise money, etc. before seeing the first farmer that was going to benefit from the tool. And I remember having a conversation and trying to convince the farmers to adopt this new solution that we had to enable them to transform their processes into what UK supermarkets would consider as organic, an organic process. And we, we said, look, this was free for you. We will provide the software tools. We'll give you this little tax that you put on the, uh, the, the, the sacks of fruits and vegetables. We will give you a particular uh, mechanism that use USSD to do these updates, etc. And when the pineapple or the, the mango gets to, to Europe and the, co the consumer buys it from a supermarket like Sainsbury's, they will be able to scan that fruit, you know, the pack of fruits, um, and they will see your farm and they will give you a tip and you receive that money through Obama. These were all the early days of, you know, FinTech and all of those things and we're thinking of all of these means. So the idea was you enjoy the fruit, then you tip your farmer. And through that mechanism, we can increase uh, the income that the farmers earn more than what they would uh, not ordinarily earn through just the margin increase. And then we said, look, this was great for you. So because of this reason, why don't you go through this change management process with us so you can be able to apply these technologies to the way you package your produce before they are sent overseas. And we have this aggregator model that is going to enable these produce to be exported. So we're targeting peppers, 
we're targeting you know the traditional non-traditional exports that are already well entrenched in the market and where there were already channels that would enable this to happen and every single farmer was of the view that we have to pay them to do this job and we're like no we don't have to pay you I mean, why would we want to pay you to help you i mean why would we want to give you money just so that you know you get more money in return we don't understand the logic of that and it was evident to their minds and that time in my green state it wasn't too evident to me, but they saw it clearly that we were benefiting more than they were. And they didn't, even though they couldn't compute out, it was really not a game of us helping them. It was a game of reciprocal altruism. Somehow they have figured it out in their own way, even though you may think that these are farmers that are not sophisticated, they don't have the same higher degrees that we do, but they could sense it very clearly that we're not there to help them. I think this notion that somehow we're doing good can block us from the systemic cognitive issues that arise when human beings interact and it sometimes makes us blind to the fact that even if that is not your motive everybody interprets everything as a matter of interest so if you're an entrepreneur you want to do green energy you want to do climate smart agriculture whatever it is that you want to do that you believe helps the planet helps people and you know people will still interpret it to mean that if you are successful it's largely your success and not their success and in recognizing that fact, I think, in recognizing that fact, I think, you are better positioned to craft your value proposition on the basis that we both benefit and be upfront and transparent about that much earlier in the process. This attempt to convince people that, oh, I'm only in this to help other people and, you know, it's not really about me, it's about you, in my experience, just doesn't work. But what is fascinating about that is this tendency to conflate micro empathy, which is how you connect to individuals on their own in your small little personal relationships, guided by your values of you know, kindness and things like that, with the kind of skill set that you need for social justice. So if it's about how you help your cousin, you know, get into university and pay their fees, it's really very much about the personal relationship, the values, the norms that you are able to create at that low level. If on the other hand, you want to change a system where you would through because you are a social justice activist you want to stop people from doing climate on smart agriculture or stop people from using polluting fuels you need to recognize the fundamental essence that your empathy while important your value as an entrepreneur why you are doing it as well it's important has very little bearing on how people interpret the systemic implications of the work you're doing so whether or not your work somehow benefits people is not necessarily reliant on how easily it is to convince people that somehow your heart is in the right place it really is a marketing challenge it's a branding challenge and like all the, the same way you will brand ice cream the same way you will brand these other things you need to think of it as not being self-evident i was too sure of myself and my partners were too sure of myself that the good that we intended to do was so self-evident that all we had to do was walk into different places and doors would be open for us it didn't happen. The other thing that I also discovered is that there's very little new under the sun. You know, as I look through the brochure and I look at your great ideas and some of you that I already know, um, I was obviously inspired like most people would be. But, you know, we have this tendency to think of innovation and to think of it in a time span basis. So we think, okay, everything that happened yesterday was not innovative. Everything that will happen tomorrow is innovative. We are on the side of history. We are on this onward march to progress and greatness and therefore it's quite self-evident that our ability to out maneuver existing systems is almost by default because yesterday was just not very smart we are going to the future and the future is so much smarter and we are the smart people who are going to deliver the future onto the world so obviously the existing systems cannot match our power we have this power of innovation this power of creativity this incredible ability to make progress. And because we're going to make so much progress, we're going to overthrow these empires that currently exist, that simply do not achieve what happened to achieve because they are not smart enough. The truth of the matter is that in actual fact, innovation is happening in waves. The same ideas keep regenerating themselves. And what they are looking for is fertile ground. The earliest automobiles were electric automobiles. They were not based on the kind of uh, internal combustion engine that we have today. They were based on something much closer to the hybrid model that today seems to be making a very strong push for some kind of mainstream presence. 
So if you're looking at this electric, uh, this uh, exhibition, this uh, um, uh, um, demonstration, what is fascinating is that in those days, because electric cars were considered so clean and so quiet, unlike carriages or horse-drawn carts, they were actually marketed as the best um, type of transport medium for women, because women were supposed to be much more empathic, much more cleaner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they were also marketed in the same way as we market them today, as giving you flexibility and choice and the rest of it. It wasn't really the value proposition per se, it just so happened, and here it's very fascinating, and I'll, I'll, I'll delve a bit more into this, because that really is the big idea of my talk. It just so happened that the historical forces and the way they were aligned require a deeper political understanding, a deeper economic understanding to make green power work. So the only reason electric, electric cars did not become dominant, and rather diesel combustion and eventually petrol combustion and the rest overtook them, is really not because the value proposition was not clear. I think the value proposition was clear from day one. And we are looking at the 1900s and early, 19, the 19, uh, early 1900s. The other thing that I also want to touch on, and I'll be integrating these ideas in time, is this fascinating story that I learned a couple of months ago about the rise and fall of whale oil as an industry. So I'm talking about whales, that's in the big mammals that live in the sea. And what most people don't realize is that in the 19th century, in the beginning to the middle of the 19th century, Whale oil was actually the big energy industry of the US and many parts of Europe. You know, they would take, they built these giant boats. Those of you that have watched Moby Dick or read the book, you've seen, you've seen this, yeah? Uh, these harpoons um, uh, equipped giant boats, ships, massive ones, and they would take them out to sea. They would look for whales, they would kill the whales, put them on the ships, process them in the ship. In fact, they were so effective that they got to a point they could process a whole whale in about 17 minutes. And then they would take away the oil and the bone and some of the wax and they would bring it into the US and sell them. Now, a lot of the fuel that was used for lamps actually came from whales. So whale oil was massive. The funny thing though is that whale oil actually rose and died in the span of half a century. And when you think carefully about why whale oil did not become the dominant energy form in the United States of America, it says a lot about these types of new industries and the entrepreneurs like us who work in them. So here is a little graph that tells you about how the industry that was whale oil collapsed. You are looking both at the prices um, and you are looking at also the production volumes. So at its peak, it cost you nearly $200 um, 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 a barrel to get the most inferior grade of whale oil. Or think of it today, if it's in Ghana terms, about 200 Ghana cities a gallon to, to get your whale oil. The funny thing is that as whale oil depleted, prices also fell, which is almost contrary to most economic theories. You know, if you're the, the substance is being depleted, which means it's becoming scarce, we should see the prices rising, which perhaps will lead to more cultivation of whale. Perhaps people will have gone into a situation where they will start breeding whale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, both prices, and quantities collapsed. And when both prices and quantities collapse, an industry is not viable anymore, right? And that is exactly what we saw about whale oil. National whaling output, which was in the millions of dollars. Remember, this is $1,800. So we are talking billions of dollars here because of inflation. The whole industry literally just collapsed in about 50 years. From the mid uh, 50s when it saw its upswing, which was just around the time that petroleum was also emerging as an industry. By the 1900s, it had died out. And it has died out primarily because sorry, it has died out primarily because of this competing industry, the um, the petroleum fuel and uh, fuel industry. So whale oil didn't die because the industry itself suffered a natural death. Whale oil died because petroleum beat it, and petroleum beat it, and obviously also beats electric cars for a number of reasons that we often don't think about as entrepreneurs. And I'm going to go into that soon. So if you look at these electric cars, you look at their pricing, you know, this dates all the way back to the 1900s, you know, and at that time, compared, comparatively, this was a, you know, a, a great deal. If you look at the pricing of these cars, if you look at how effective they were in, in those periods, the convenience, all of those measures were brilliant. 
But something happened. Something happened, which is also similar to what happened to solar energy when it was first uh, broached in the early 1900s. So a lot of people don't realize, but the first major solar thermal plant was actually in Egypt. Uh, it was in, in Arabia that attempt was made, obviously because it was obvious, they had a lot of sunshine, so why not build a solar industry? And in the early 1900s, a guy called Frank Schumann went into Egypt, built this first plant that you are looking at. Uh, this was in 1912, thereabouts, and around 1916, there was already a lot of newspaper articles about how this powerful fuel of, of you know, this powerful new concept of solar was going to take over um, the whole of the electricity industry. We also know, for instance, that when we first started locomotives in Ghana, so you're thinking of, you know, the very late 1800s to the early 1900s, it was, these were steam-powered locomotives. So we're using steam power, and a lot of that steam power was also a hybrid-based model, not based on coal. So it was diesel, electric, steam locomotives that we were, were using in Ghana around the same period that I'm describing all of these matters. They failed because invariably reality is not our friend we have this tendency as social justice entrepreneurs as climate uh, change uh, activists as all of these do good domain operators we have this tendency of forgetting that it is not really one monolithic reality which eventually somehow the world is going to catch up to there's this tendency that you know the reality is on our side it's just that the world hasn't caught up to the reality and if somehow the world understood how obvious it is that we have to move away from fossil fuels, how obvious it is that we have to stop polluting groundwater by putting so many chemicals into the soil and move to organic, if somehow the world was just more knowledgeable about these matters, because this, was, this, is, this is the reality, we will prevail. It is not really the case. Like I was telling you about my organic failure, a lot of people need reality altered for them for our approach to succeed. It, it's a very sad reality sometimes, but I also think it's a very positive and uplifting message, which is that we have to go out there and engineer reality. The world is not just going to somehow come to this reality. The world is not just how I'm going to wake up one morning and discover that this didn't make any sense to continue using fossil fuels, or this just didn't make any sense to continue eating uh, tomatoes full of pesticides. No, that is not going to happen. And the reason why it doesn't happen is exactly how the things that do happen succeed. The people that destroyed, whether it's whale oil or your electric, nascent electric and solar industries in the early 1900s in the US are the famous oil barons that all of us have heard about. What we have not often paid attention to is how they did it versus how we sometimes try to do it in the green space, in the social change space, in the social innovation space. A lot of the efforts by Rockefeller, Flegia, and the others who built Standard Oil, and which eventually became Chevron and all of these big oil baron um, industries. The, the thing that they realized quickly was that you needed to engineer the new reality by fusing power, knowledge, passion, and all of those things into one composite. You needed to build alliances that took into account the politics, the economics, and you couldn't simply operate as if the value proposition was self-evident. And when you look at how much effort the oil industry, how much effort the dirty industries of the world have put into constructing a monolith that simply superimposes on reality, it becomes obvious that reality must be engineered if you have to succeed. The amount of money they spend lobbying to make it look as if fossil fuels or all of these other non-clean stuff is the main street is the obvious choice and it is us who are somehow trying to come up with something fantastical you know so we are made out to be the fantastical fantasy bearers we are the ones that are all the time drowned in fantasy of change they on the other hand are the mainstream they are the obvious they are the natural choice and we don't realize how much effort money uh, reputation all of this stuff that they've invested over many years to make that reality evident. We often don't realize that. And so we think that what we have to do is just simply to change minds. And I think that is not true. I think that change comes through the intersection of three types of things. Power, knowledge, and passion. All the three must integrate. 
to do that, to do that requires that you also understand what is not this particular intersection, which is why I've shown you that sometimes what we have in, in activism is that it's just knowledge and passion. Very often all the activism, and that includes a lot of the entrepreneurship that is based on changing the world, is very much focused on fusing passion and knowledge. And does not take into account this dynamic of power. I think to me, what is missing in our world as social entrepreneurs, social innovators, change activists, green entrepreneurs, people that want to transform how society lives, is this misunderstanding of power, of the, the necessary ingredient that power is. And the fact that Often, the people that are passionate and are powerful also exercise control. They don't necessarily have the knowledge, which often as activists we're forced to acquire, but they exercise control. And the people that have a lot of power and knowledge operate at a level of elitism that respond more to that control than they respond to activism. In fact, I'll make the argument that it's not just control. If you look at it very carefully, when power and passion meet, what you have is domination. And for those that are in the United States and observing the politics of the United States today, where we live in a post-truth world or a post-fact world, we've seen the power of combining power and passion minus knowledge. But we've also seen how activists have failed to redeem America from the brink and how as activists in other domains, whether in business or in some areas such as innovation, we've also not been successful enough in redeeming the world from the brink. Another way of looking at it is to say that typically there are three intertwining dimensions of personal values that makes one effective as part of a collective. And there's a famous uh, Warren Buffett argument that there are really three things, energy, intelligence, and integrity. But if you don't have integrity, which is at the apex, very often the other two create danger. It's, a really, it's really the same concept at play here. There has to be a way in which, from your standpoint as a values-driven entrepreneur, you are able to shape a process that eventually lead to some domain of power mobilization and acquisition. You have to somehow be able to transform yourself and then having transformed yourself embed in an environmental process that will change you into a location where you have power. And now I'll bring it home to our context in Ghana. There is absolutely no doubt as we sit here that the kind of businesses that are being built by the people that are participating in this amazing initiative at the Ghana Climate Innovation Center is urgently needed. There's no doubt about it at all. We live in a country where renewable energy consumption is really on a massive decline because of the collapse of hydro as a source and the increasing rise of thermal as a source of power. We also live in a country where increasingly air particulate matter and other types of pollution are on an extraordinary rise. This is not an academic lecture, so I didn't bring a lot of that information. But anyone living in Ghana now has to be extremely frightened because the pandemics we're going to see are going to be way more dangerous than we are witnessing now under COVID. Why? Because we are on the verge of environmental-induced health collapse. And it's not just the galamsey destroying water. It's also the amount of fumes and exhaust that in our major cities we are currently outputting. It's also about the soil quality and the amount of chemicals that we are dumping in soils. We all saw the famous Abubloshi matter, where it's quite clear now that about a million times more, the quantities of lead and cadmium and these types of poisonous carcinogenic material are going into the soil in parts of the country. That should be the case. Nobody has to convince us that Ghana is on the completely opposite trajectory from any sound environmental path. We are going the exact opposite. As a country, we now, the West, it's a pity that I think because of the, the screen sharing, some of the, the images are, are contracted. But the key point of this graph is that Ghana now leads the world in terms of the speed at which our natural biocapacity is depleting, 
using forest as the gold standard of measurement for biocapacity. Ghana has the fastest rate of depleting biocapacity in the world, literally in the world. This is ridiculous. We also know that when it comes to pure pollution, when they've measured um, that particulate matter and other types of carcinogen um, measurements in the air, only the DRC is doing worse than us in some of those categories. So it's a country that should now be balanced on the brink. It's a country that should now be operating on the basis of an emergency similar to the one that we've declared for COVID-19. The truth, however, is that those of you that are in this cohort, this amazing cohort, that have set yourself out, you've set up yourself as warriors to take Ghana from this brink and redeem the society, the fact of the matter is that you cannot win and lose. No matter how great you become as an entrepreneur, and I could have made this talk all about you know, how you should be more effective in raising money, how you should be more effective in planning your product design. I could have said all of those things, but I want to assure you that in the domain that you want to operate, the social change domain, as the type of entrepreneur you have to be cannot be the traditional successful entrepreneur of the despite, the Dan Macaulay, the Kennedy Japan, the whatever type of famous entrepreneur you've heard of in Ghana type. It just won't work. And that is my blatant, extremely unapologetic message to all of us who are in this domain. That it's simply not possible to just focus on our own little product design, our own little business model, and somehow make a huge breakthrough in this domain. The kind of things that have to change for new industries to emerge, which will make us successful, whether it's in climate smart agriculture, whether it's in recycling, whatever that domain is, require a multitude of changes happening simultaneously, which mean that we have to operate through ecosystems. We have to work in tandem with other forces that are operating in the politics of this country, and obviously this region, that are operating in the economic transformation of this region, that are operating in the social and the moral regeneration of this country in order for us to create the new industries and the new markets that are so important. And here is why it's so critical that we recognize that we have to build new markets. A lot of the time, entrepreneurs are concerned about business development. And it's true that business development is very critical, except that in the space that we are in and the space that we are discussing right now, you need to be building and developing markets, whole new markets. You have to be working together to build industries from the scratch, just as they did in the US in oil. Oil went one because the people that build the oil industry also moved into the railway industry, built extreme alliances that were so interlocked, that were so coupled, that the transportation system of America evolved into a situation where fossil fuels was the natural commodity. It wasn't as if that was just going to ha happen by, by default. No, they moved into transportation, invested huge amount of resources and time, they lobbied Congress, they worked together, they colluded. And by the time America realized it, both the utility infrastructure and the transport infrastructure had been so integrated in the with the energy infrastructure that that was just the way the society functioned. And if we are going to go in and do recycling at scale, if we are going to go in and do climate smart agriculture at scale, we are going to have to think what are the adjacent industries that operate alongside the things we want to do and what kind of alliances we need to build, what kind of open innovation models we need to build in order for that to work. It may look abstract, it may sound abstract, but I assure you it is not abstract. Let me give you a very practical example. If today you wanted to do what I wanted to do 15 years ago and do organic agriculture, you have to take into account the overall non-traditional export sector in food and how we are struggling to get that food into the European Union due to contamination by aflatoxins and the rest. If you were to come up with a model that also addressed this through your smart agricultural models, 
the likelihood that you get government support, the likelihood that big exporters in Europe and the rest will be interested, etc., will be manifold. Because ultimately, the integrated infrastructure for extension services, etc., all of these dynamics that must interlock, so that you are able to sell maize without aflatoxins, are very relevant to how you're going to be able to sell your produce as organic. And you need to find other business partners in those domains and build these alliances so that even though people do not care enough about soil being polluted, so long as they care about the fact that our maize and our peppers are not being allowed outside Ghana because of plot toxins, you are more likely to make progress that way. So you will need to understand why is it that extension services uh, are failing to prevent this problem from recurring. Every couple of weeks, we see that palm oil from Ghana is banned. Every couple of months, sorry. Palm oil from Ghana is banned. We see that peanut butter cannot come from Ghana because of these contaminants. What is it that is required to build these alliances that will ensure that indeed, as we are solving the issues of climate resilience, we are also solving the issues of contamination. And through that effort, we are bringing our value proposition in sync with the reality as must be engineered. I will conclude by saying that this requires bravery above all. I think as entrepreneurs, we're going to have to recognize that activism is not some kind of side issue. But activism is not simply finding a cause that you believe in that nobody else believes in. I think there is such a thing as activist entrepreneurship, where you are actively building new realities. And on the back of those new realities, you are erecting new markets and new industries. And you are working closely and in partnership with allies in civil society, in some aspects of the political economy. And through those types of interactions, you are building an ecosystem that will make it possible for you to thrive in your own domain. I think it's so important that you recognize that there, are, there isn't just a, a simple market gap issue to fill. You know, there's a gap in the market. I have to be extremely effective in my research and my product design, and I just feel it. You have to recognize that in most of these areas, you're going to have to reconstruct the reality that exists. And in reconstructing the reality that exists, you're going to need allies. So first, I will exhort you, members of the fifth cohort of the Ghana Climate Innovation Center program that I'm currently addressing, I will exhort you to make a formal, deliberate effort to build alliances among your own, within your own teams. Essentially, be much more deliberate about finding out how your business models can interlock to create new industries. Secondly, I will exhort you not to think of your role as purely one who finds arbitrage opportunities as an entrepreneur and plugs in, but as one who is going out there to reconstruct reality. And that requires, therefore, that you are bold that you are a, a, a missionary, that you are constantly promoting not your business alone, but the world you want to see. Nobody cares about your business, I'll be very blunt with you. Nobody cares about your darling product, I'll be very blunt with you. People care about the state of the world they inhabit, and they want champions who they believe are on their side in bringing that state to a level where it benefits them and their children. How are you going to become those missionaries? those people who are painting a new vision of reality and championing it. It requires that you become associated with the course that you are in. So it's not merely that I have this amazing tool of doing recycling, or I have this amazing software package that enables waste management companies to be able to be more efficient, efficiently build each other. It's about how you reposition those messages to reflect what must change in this society. It's about the fact that if waste companies are not being paid for months thereafter, the waste will accumulate on the streets. And that is your mission. Your mission is not your little products. Your mission is not even your big products. Your mission is not even your fantastic products. Your mission is to paint a vision of reality about the world that can enable you to mobilize a whole constituency, a constituency behind you, similar to the way that the politicians do it. I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you.